Rust is an incredible language, but writing maintainable and scalable code still requires good design patterns. In this video, we'll cover five of the most common software design patterns, providing animations and examples to give a deeper understanding of the concepts. The first pattern we will cover is the Builder pattern, which is useful when constructing objects that can be built in a variety of different ways, allowing a high degree of flexibility. To demonstrate this, we will create a Burger Builder class that allows us to progressively construct a burger. We will define the burger components that can be added, and the class itself, which initializes itself with a bottom bun. We also add a function for new components, and define a build function that we can use to finalize our object once it's complete. Now we can define the burger builder instance, adding components one at a time. Then finally, calling the build method to finalize it. The power here is we can construct objects in an infinite amount of ways without any real restrictions in the class itself, which makes the builder pattern especially useful when dealing with complex objects that require step-by-step -step construction. The next pattern is the factory pattern, which is all about delegating the construction of objects to a factory class. This is especially useful when constructing complex objects and you want to abstract away all that complexity to provide a simple interface. Let's connect this back to a code example. First, we will define a shared trait for the things our factory produces, which in this case just logs what they are. Our factory will produce two types of toys, cars and robots. Both will implement the toy trait. We then define the types of toys our factory will produce. And finally, we create the factory, which can build a toy based on the toy type. If we want to build a robot, we just call it with the robot type. And similarly, to build a car, we supply the car type. This approach keeps object creation centralized, making it much easier to extend. The next pattern we will cover is RAII, which stands for Resource Acquisition is Initialization. This is a bit of a mouthful, but the concept itself is simple. Think of this like a magic treasure chest with a key. But this treasure chest is a little different and immediately opens or closes depending on whether you hold the key. Once you release the key, the chest immediately locks itself again. Let's demonstrate this with some code. In this example, we'll represent the treasure chest with a mutex. Once again, to access the chest, we will need to acquire the key, which is possible by the lock function on the mutex. Now with the key, we can unwrap the data and edit it. We then close the created scope, which ensures that the key we just acquired will go out of scope, causing the chest to immediately relock itself. This is a powerful feature of Rust ownership model, which automatically enables this functionality. This pattern ensures that resources like files, locks, or memory are properly managed and cleaned up when they go out of scope, which results in far fewer runtime bugs. Now the next pattern is the type state pattern, which helps us manage operations and program state via a type. By taking advantage of Rust strict type system, we can track and manage program states explicitly and get immediate type safety at compile time. To demonstrate this, we'll create a file struct that restricts operations based on whether the file is open or closed. Let's first implement the functionality for the closed state, which simply allows us to open the file. Now we can define the operations for when the file is open, which you can read, write, or close the file. Note that this is a bit inefficient and creates new copies of objects, which should suffice for the example. To demonstrate its use, let's create a new file object, which we will initialize as closed. We can open the file, then read it and write to it. Then finally, we can close the file. By leveraging Rust type system and generics, we've been able to define specific methods depending on the file's state. This approach not only improves code safety, but also prevents invalid operations at compile time. The final pattern we will cover is the new type pattern, which helps us enforce stronger type safety by wrapping primitive values inside custom types. This prevents accidental misuse and allows us to define custom behaviors for our types. Say we create a program that is handling meters and seconds. We want to immediately prevent misusing these, so we define custom types for each. Now we can easily define our variables, distance and time. Then we can define a function that takes in both types and calculates the speed traveled. Notice that this is very easy to read and immediately prevents passing incorrect types. Design patterns provide a clearer structure to your code. I hope this video gave some insight into how these patterns work and how they might help you write more maintainable and scalable code.